Hello, folks, and welcome. We're going to give everyone just a moment to log into Zoom tonight for our program before we get started. All right, so while folks are still trickling in, I am going to do just a brief introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Gianna. I'm one of the reference librarians here at the Chelmsford Public Library. And again, thank you all for joining us for tonight's Art on Thursday presents Andy Warhol's 15 Minutes of Fame. Pop artist Andy Warhol famously elevated everyday objects like soup cans to works of fine art. His paintings, silk screens, and photography often focused on American consumerism, not just of products, but of celebrities and images themselves. This program will look at the abbreviated life, artwork, and enduring legacy of the artist who predicted, in the future, everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes. So to pass it on over to Jane, our presenter. So Jane O'Neill holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from the Harvard University Graduate School of Education. She is a New Hampshire native and has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane founded the Courier's Alzheimer's Cafe and led the tour program for the museum and the Frank Lloyd Wright designed Zimmerman House. She has taught art history at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at New Hampshire Institute of Art. And if you're more curious about Jane's programs um, and more about her, um, please visit IamCulturallyCurious.com. I'll make sure to put that in the chat. Any questions for tonight's program, also throw those in the chat or the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom menu down there, and we can get to those at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it on over to Jane. Thank you so much, Gianna, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. I'm always, I just feel so privileged to have your time and attention. So thank you for being here. It's such a pleasure for me to put together these programs and to share them with you. And tonight we're in for such a treat. I know I say that every month, don't I? <laughs> but tonight we really are in for a treat because Andy Warhol is was the king of the pop art movement. He is a cultural icon. He was one of the most important artists of the 20th century, if not the most important. It's sort of him and Pablo Picasso. So he was an artist who explored the relationships between artistic expression, celebrity culture, advertising, and his own identity as an openly gay man before the gay liberation movement. So there is so much to talk about when it comes to Andy Warhol. Um, we could spend weeks on him, but we're, I've tried to cram as much good information into uh, this one hour that we have together. So let me give you a sense in terms of how we'll spend this hour together. We will be getting back to this lovely lady on the screen in just a little while. But um, here we have the artist himself standing in front of one of his sil silk screens. And I've sort of given our sections here uh, fun little titles that refer to the way Andy Warhol worked. So uh, he would start off with a template before making a lot of his work. And in this case, his template is really his early years. So we'll talk about how that sort of got... Um, his interests and um, and his his focus uh, to sort of come together in the first couple decades of his life. <clears throat> then we'll talk about how he launches himself, his career, his art his artwork in the commercial world, how he turns to branding when it comes to the world of fine art, and how he begins to brand himself. And then he br brings production to scale, essentially, and, and opens the factory. His continuing fascination with celebrity, and then later death. And then we will finish up with his legacy. Like I said, so much to cover here. So let's dive right in to the template, his early years in this case. Andy Warhol was born Andrew Warhola. He was born in 1928 and he grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He was the youngest son from Slovakian immigrant parents. Um, he had two older brothers, if I'm remembering correctly, but this is him probably around the age of, of three or four uh, sitting on his mother's lap here. Now his, his, his parents were very devout and they would actually attend Catholic mass several times a week at a Byzantine Catholic church in the neighborhood. And this is the actual altar of that church. So you can imagine 
what an impression this space made on young Andrew Warhalla, uh, sitting in the space for hours at a time every week, absorbing the colors, the format of these of these painted saints and all of these icons here. So uh, th this will certainly have an impact on his work later on. Now, as a young man, we can see him here probably as an early teen and then around the age of 18 over on the right. As a young man, he had uh, several struggles that he had to deal with. One of them was the fact that he had choreo, which is also known as St. Vitus's dance. It's a neurological disorder, which basically means like sometimes your limbs kind of flail um, um, involuntarily. And sometimes it means that you can have kind of like discoloration uh, and um, on, on your face. So he was actually kind of teased and bullied over this. I believe he, uh, um, the little kids called him Andy, the red-nosed Warhalla. So Corey kept him out of schools uh, for months at a time. And that was a, a chance for him to really connect with his mother. She would buy him movie magazines where he would read all about the celebrities and he would play with paper cutouts. His parents very much supported his his interest in the arts, even though he was growing up in the Great Depression, by the time he was 13 years old, they had um, bought him a camera so that he could continue exploring this interest. Now, unfortunately, his father died in an accident when he was just a young teenager, but um, that only served to really cement this strong relationship that he had with his mother. The image that we see over here on the right was taken by one of his brothers on the day before he uh, started college in 1945. It, he went to what is now Carnegie Mellon University um, in right there in Pittsburgh. And when he went to school, he went to study essentially commercial art. I believe his major was, um, oh, it was just that commercial art. And he served as the art director for the student magazine. So we're just looking at two examples of his student work. And I wanted to share them with you because it shows us that at this young age, he's been exposed to European modernism. He is showing us this kind of flattened, somewhat flattened perspective in the interior space over here on the left, this interest in, um, in, in certainly flattened figures here and, and, and patterning this sort of reminds me of the fact that he was doing paper cutouts as a little boy. He was also very interested in dance, incidentally, while he was at school. So um, he earns his bachelor's Bachelor of Fine Arts in Pictorial Design in 1949, and he is ready to take on the world. This is his launch, actually. He boldly decides, I'm going to move to New York City and pursue a career as a commercial artist. And good for young Andrew Warhalla because he um, got a gig almost instantly for Glamour Magazine. This is his illustration um, for a... a, 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 a an article appropriately uh, titled Success is a Job in New York. He's like illustrating his life in some ways, but he's shown us this fancy young lady who has climbed the ladder, is perched high above the city, and is kind of triumphantly smoking her little cigarette there. So we already get a sense that he can create these modern images, these charming, somewhat whimsical images. And this uh, sort of becomes characteristic of his style while he's working. This is a, a sort of later illustration that he did, but it shows that um, even in his illustrations, he's certainly happy to integrate the actual logos and, um, and particular fonts of, of specific products that he likes. So um, we'll see that translates very much to his, his work as a fine art artist as well. But in terms of his commercial work, and he did do commercial work in, um, in New York City for really the better part of the 1950s. So uh, when we're thinking about his work at this time, one of the things that he becomes uh, particularly well known for is what's called the blotted line ink drawing. And this is a great example of what he was doing. And this is something that you could easily do at your own home if you have maybe some photo paper or some very shiny paper. Essentially, he, he does an ink drawing on that shiny paper. So the, that paper resists the ink and it's sort of resting on the surface. And then he presses that shiny paper into a regular sheet of paper, which absorbs that ink. It is a very rudimentary form of printmaking and it gives us this really uneven um, 
um, again, sort of a whimsical line here, especially if you're illustrating a, a unicorn, for example, over here. And this became a, a, a very popular style at the time. And he, like I said, he really mastered it. He was also pretty well known for illustrating or drawing shoes. He worked very closely with a shoe designer named Israel Miller, and he just he loved to do these shoes and, and Israel Miller loved what, what Andy Warhol produced for him too. He said uh, the bow was always in just the right place. Now, apparently Andy Warhol uh, felt so confident about these shoes that he was making that he apparently sent one of his shoe drawings off to the Museum of Modern Art. We don't know exactly which shoe drawing, but it could look a lot like this uh, blotted ink line drawing that we see over here on the left. And here in 1956, well, we see the rejection letter. <laughs> here he was so confident in his work as a young man still in his 20s. He submits a work for consideration to enter into the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. And they say, oh, no thanks. I'm sure they're sort of kicking themselves over that one. But we see at this sort of fairly uh, early stage in this young man's life, he is thinking about making the leap from commercial art to fine art. And so it's not um, it's not a one shot deal for him. He, he has to kind of struggle to break into that world. Now he has um, some added support in his life because just a few years after he moves to New York City, his mother, Julia, ends up moving with him, moving in with him, I should say. So they're sharing an apartment and apparently they shared this apartment with 25 cats. <laughs> now, um, it's really hard for me to imagine living with 25 cats in New York City. But, um, but his mother was also an artist in her own right. And so one of the things that Andy Warhol was doing as a young man in his 20s to kind of make a name for himself and probably make a few extra dollars was he was uh, self-publishing these little art books and this is one about cats. I believe his mother did um, did uh, did the writing in these books. And you can see these are hand colored books that they were creating, which sort of added the value to them. And Andy Warhol did something really smart when it came to the hand coloring of these books. You know, to do it all would be so much work. So what he did was he assembled his friends at this now very famous cafe called Serendipity 3 in New York City. And he basically had his friends doing the hand coloring in almost like um, a factory setting, you know? Um, so you just go down this factory line and one friend would color this cat, the next friend would color the next. And it's so fascinating for me to think of him creating a factory out of his friends so early on in his career. It's also really interesting to consider too, that this cafe was frequented by celebrities, including Marilyn Monroe, who we know becomes a, a pretty central to, to Andy's focus in um, not too short a time. Now, I've been referring to him as An Andrew Andy or Andrew Borhalla this whole time. Um, that was the way he presented himself to the world. Uh, it really wasn't until he kind of uh, carved out a niche for himself in New York City that he dropped that last A in his name. So he just becomes Andy Warhol. But really at this time, he was known as Raggedy Andy. He would walk around the street, the, the city in this kind of frumpled suit with a little bow tie and the glasses. And he would go from like editor to editor and, and submit his work or solicit um, opportunities. <clears throat> Now, even though he was finding the success, uh, there are all sorts of wonderfully embarrassing stories about him at this stage of his career, too. He told one that included uh, where he went to go meet with an editor and he took out this little leather portfolio that he had to sh show examples of his work. He unzips it and apparently a cockroach uh, came, uh, came walking out of his portfolio. He said that the editor took pity on him and offered him a job from there. So, like I said, he was doing well for himself, but he longed for something else. And now I mentioned at the start of the program that he was openly gay. And so uh, as he's thinking about breaking into the world of fine art, one of his first forays into doing that, besides submitting work to the Museum of Modern Art, was uh, he presented a, a solo exhibition in 1956, so that same year that he submitted his drawing. And this solo exhibition was called Studies for a Boy Book. And essentially, they were sketchbook drawings of sort of homoerotic sketchbook drawings of young men. And, um, and a lot of them were male nudes. Now, this is the middle of the 1950s in, um, in New York City. Think uh, Mad Men, right? <laughs> it, it wasn't really 
uh, well, the world wasn't really prepared for what Andy Warhol was offering. And if we think about what was happening in the art world at this time, you have abstract expressionism. We're just coming off the heels of Jackson Pollock, like throwing and splattering paint and, and presenting himself as this intense macho man, this cowboy. And then uh, along comes Andy Warhol, who seems so effeminate, he's the opposite of, of so many of, of these abstract expressionists who uh, seemed really powerful and visceral in so many ways. So the world just wasn't quite ready for sweet Andy Warhol yet. So that's why we turn our attention to branding. And this is really, uh, well, this becomes a major focus for him and it changes the way he engages with uh, commercial illustration and the world of fine art. Thinking about branding uh, revolutionizes everything. And this is really where pop art begins. Now, most people think of Andy Warhol when they think of pop art, but he did not start the movement. It actually started over in Britain, but he is synonymous with it because he really had um, this... Uh, well, this way of, of bringing together the ideas of, um, of using logos and symbols from, um, from, some, from mass media, from popular culture and integrating them into his work. So we're looking at two, three examples of, of his work around the subject of Coca-Cola. And these were done just between the years of 1961 and 1962. So we can see a big difference in terms of how he's approaching this subject. Uh, this evolves very quickly over a short time. So um, in terms of Coca-Cola, why would you choose Coca-Cola? Uh, he loved the idea that Coca-Cola was the same, no matter where you got it and no matter who you were. If you were the president, you'd be drinking the same kind of Coke as like, you know, a homeless person on the street. So um, that uniformity is something that he really appreciated. So as he begins to think about uh, uh sort of combining commercial illustration and art, we can see that he has painted a Coca-Cola bottle. And there's all of this evidence of the artist's hand here. And there's a, quite a bit of, of expressive sort of gesture in his painting here. And he even obscures the label, the, the, the logo to a certain extent. We very much see and understand that this is an artist sort of playing with and considering um, the subject of Coca-Cola. But then <laughs> he turns this all around. He creates this six foot tall painting of um, practically the same subject. And, and now it looks like a commercial illustration. The evidence of the artist's hand is completely gone. <laughs> and of course, this level of polish, this level of finish is something that artists have have aspired to for um, for centuries, but usually not for commercial purposes. So um, so he's kind of turning himself into a machine here again. And then he takes it one step further by using the silkscreen process to create these stacked Coca-Cola bottles, which almost look like something that you'd see in the freezer uh, or in the refrigerator at a grocery store or something that you'd see printed on cheap tabloid newspaper. And so some of these Coca-Cola bottles are, you know, they're not printed uh, entirely. They are, um, they're slightly obscured, but they're still, they're still discernible here. So he's kind of playing with the very notion of the ubiquity of this product and how recognizable it is. And of course, these are themes that he goes back to again and again and again throughout his career. Now, if you're not the biggest Andy Warhol fan, or if you're sort of just getting familiar with pop art at this very moment, you might be thinking, how is this art? <laughs> he's just making, he's just making illustrations of a product. How is this art? Well, he is standing on the shoulders of the geniuses that came before him in the 20th century. So hat tip to Marcel Duchamp, who um, in the first decades of the 20th century was really pushing the boundaries of, of what people considered to be art. And he did this most famously with this sculpture, a ready-made sculpture, meaning he did not make this. And it is in fact a urinal, it, but it's something that he chose to put on display in a gallery setting. He did not alter it at all. He just picked it and he actually signed a fake name to it and dated it. And by doing this, Marcel Duchamp uh, forced everybody to consider that perhaps art is not about something you make with your hands or it doesn't have to be something you make with your hands. Art can simply be a novel idea. 
And that was something that galvanized Andy Warhol. In fact, Andy Warhol went on to uh, collect quite a bit of Marcel Duchamp's work. So, um, so this is kind of the concept that that Warhol is working with. And it's interesting to say that, or, or it's interesting to note that Andy Warhol once said, um, art is what you can get away with. So that brings us ultimately to those famous Campbell soup cans, um, the product that uh, is probably most closely associated with Andy Warhol. So these are 32 cans here uh, done in 1962. And it's really the early 1960s where we see this breakthrough into um, uh, pop art proper. So he painted these, he used a systematic process in order to do this. And it was multi-step. He would project the image, trace it, paint it, and then stamp it. It's the, that little golden fleur de -lis at the bottom. This was something that he stamped on there. And you'll notice too, of course, we've got all the different flavors here. <laughs> so, um, so once again, it looks like a commercial illustration. It's very hard to see the hand of the artist when you're looking at this. Um, and you might be thinking, why Campbell soup cans, you know? And um, the most realistic answer that I have for that is supposedly he ate a lot of Campbell soup ate, uh, during his lifetime, but it's also this, um, this very low cost product that was uh, mass produced and mass consumed and sort of ubiquitous in American culture. So I think that probably played a big role in terms of why he chose this as a subject matter. So um, when you look at Andy Warhol's Campbell soup cans, I, I have a feeling that um, that maybe emotionally you're kind of falling flat right now. I, I doubt anybody is sitting at their computer screen right now just weeping at the beauty of the Campbell soup cans because this isn't really about um, the, the talent involved or the skill involved or even so much about the creative expression of the artist, right? Uh, this isn't uh, any sort of high-minded or elitist subject. Uh, instead, it's really just him pushing us to consider maybe the definition of art is a little bit broader than what we thought of it as um, than what we thought of it before. And Andy Warhol was still so young when he came up with the idea of the Campbell soup cans. Here he is, this is like such a reminder, he was like practically a boy as he's pushing these boundaries. And the Museum of Modern Art held a symposium on pop art. And basically everybody's kind of fighting about the definitions and where it's going and all that. But he was, his name was at the center of the drama at the symposium because nobody could really believe what he was doing. He was like capitulating to consumer culture in such a brazen way. And nobody fully understood the why and the how of it. Uh, when he was asked direct questions by reporters, he would always kind of um, hem it and haw and do a lot of, um, I don't know, um, and, 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 and be a, a, a little um, opaque in terms of, of his uh, mission here. And I wanted to share with you just a few other Campbell soup cans that I, I find to be really fun. This is one with a torn label. And this just like, this viscerally takes me back to my childhood and eating Campbell soup cans. And there's always one with a torn label. And you can see like, you can, you, you go back to the sensory experience of what it was to tear that label, but how perfect that he strove so hard to create the perfect Campbell soup cans, but he's also willing to damage and destroy it too. Um, and then over on the right, uh, an example of his silk screens from later in the 1960s with these really bright colors. In fact, those bright colors inspired uh, Campbell Soup to do a specific 50th anniversary label, the 50th anniversary of Andy Warhol's Campbell Soup paintings. And they issued this just for the Target big box store, but they put Andy Warhol on the can and a facsimile of his signature there. And I think Andy Warhol would have loved the idea that his, that his imagery was be literally being mass consumed. <laughs> it, it's all coming full circle there. Now from uh, from the Campbell soup cans came the Brillo boxes. And we see him here uh, posing with the Brillo boxes. And these, these were familiar grocery market staples too. They were cardboard box, boxes filled with uh, st steel pads for uh, cleaning your dishes. And over here, Andy Warhol and his studio recreated these boxes with with not with cardboard, but with um, plywood. 
and they just recreated the labels using house paint and state and, and and stencils and then they ex exhibited them in galleries stacked up tightly like you see here to essentially mirror what you might see in a grocery store. And I think it's probably also worth noting that it's the 1960s, it's post-war America, that everything's commodified, there's an abundance of goods, there's no sense of scarcity. So for a young man that grew up in the depression, looking at the world that suddenly looks like this was probably um, a startling kind of visual uh, stimulation for him. And it's something that he was responding to. Now, once again, you might be wondering if he's pulled the wool over your eyes, pun intended, but, um, but he could be kind of playing with these bigger questions about what is American culture right now. So as he's considering branding in terms of making this leap from the world of commercial art to fine art, he begins branding himself too. He, gone are the days of Raggedy Andy, right? There's no more bow ties. Now all of a sudden he's Mr. Cool. And he would even talk about like putting on his Andy suit to go out. For the most part, it was um, the glasses. He was uh, almost always dressing all in black, and he had and he affected this whole new personality, uh, at least publicly. One of his friends described it this way. He said his metamorphosis into a pop persona was calculated and deliberate. The foppery was left behind, and he gradually evolved from a sophisticate who held subscription tickets to the Metropolitan Opera to a sort of gum chewing, seemingly naive teeny bopper addicted to the lowest forms of popular culture. So of course, Andy Warhol's look is instantly recognizable. So write this on your calendar right now. It will be the easiest Halloween costume come October. So basically he wore all black. It was like Steve Jobs or uh, Elizabeth Warren. It's almost like he was somebody who devoted all of his, um, creative thinking to things that were way more important than than putting together a stylish outfit and then of course he becomes known for the wigs later on and these photos here too sort of showing that evolution are also a good reminder of how self-conscious he was about his own appearance you can see um, some discoloration in his skin here too from that childhood disease obviously he had a receding hairline which is why he started playing with wigs too so that will sort of come back up again as we move through through uh, the program tonight. So we see him kind of launching himself, he's branding himself, and now it's, it's time to, um, like I said, bring the production to scale. And that's why you would open a factory, right? It's time to make some real money. And Andy Warhol said, being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. Making money is art and working is art and good business is the best art. <laughs> so here we have Andy Warhol making art about money. <laughs> and this is a little bit like those Coca-Cola bottles that we saw before, an early work that um, replicates something that is uh, instantly recognizable, a $1 bill, but there's still this expressive um, component to it. And then the silk screens of the, of the $1 bills where we can see that he is playing with the recognizability and discernibility of this image. And then later on, just, the dollar signs. It's all about money. It's all about value. Um, and even though it's easy to say, okay, well, he's just doing the same thing that we saw with the Coke. Uh, this is a little bit different. This isn't a grocery store commodity. This is essentially Andy Warhol um, creating works about the, uh, that are about the, the very value of the things that he's creating. He is essentially painting his paychecks <laughs> as he's painting money. Um, so he he would say that this is a subject that he was truly passionate about. Incidentally, this other version of a $1 bill that he created in 1962, recently sold for more than $32 million. I think Andy Warhol would have been so proud if he knew that that was what to, was to become of his $1 bill here. So Andy Warhol had a, a pretty sort of flippant idea about um, how his artwork related to money and how his patrons might think of, of collecting his artwork. He said, I like money on the wall. Say you were going to buy a painting. I think you should just take that money, tie it up and hang it on the wall. 
then when somebody visited you, the first thing they would see is the money on the wall. So why not just paint the dollar sign and, and make it clear that somebody spent a lot of money for it, essentially. So this is um, an exhibition of his dollar sign works from 2004. Now, where was he doing all of this? Uh, let's turn our attention to where the money was being made. This is a 1966 photograph of Andy Warhol in his studio known as the factory or the silver factory because you'll notice that it is completely covered in aluminum foil. And you might be thinking, why would he do that? Well, of course, the, the silver color, I think, sort of references a, a factory setting and mass production. And, um, and the foil itself was cheap and mass produced too. So I'm sure he, he enjoyed it for that reason. So uh, the factory was founded in 1962 and it had three different locations over about the next two decades. So it was like an institution there for some time. And it wasn't just a place where um, artwork was made. It was a gathering place too. So um, legendary parties at Andy Warhol's factory. And if you're, if you're searching for him in this crowd, I think this is him back here with the sunglasses on. Um, this is a photo from 1964. Andy Warhol surrounded himself with fascinating people, um, artists, musicians, intellectuals, drag queens, playwrights, bohemian street people, and then of course, wealthy patrons. You could go to a party at the factory and maybe run into Truman Capote, Bob Dylan, Mick Jagger, Allen Ginsberg. I mean, everybody kind of moved through there at some point or another. And if you were really lucky, Andy Warhol might take you over for a screen test. Now, what is a screen test? We are looking at a film still from one of his screen tests. They were, um, they were filmings that were rarely pre-arranged. It was like this opportunity presents itself and Andy Warhol or one of his assistants would take a guest who was there at the factory, have them sit down and stare directly into a camera for about three minutes. And that's all that they're tasked to do. And oftentimes Andy Warhol or his assistant would just walk away. And then the screen test was essentially playing back that footage in slow motion. So you can imagine if you're watching it, every sort of glance to the side or blink all of a sudden is imbued with all, all the significance and you become fascinated by the tiny movements of this space. It was an absolutely novel approach to portraiture. And I think it's something that a lot of artists today are still kind of playing with. I mean, I think we all kind of play with it to a certain degree if, if you're playing with your phone and, 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 and selfies. So Andy Warhol made about 500 of these screen uh, tests over the course of just like two or three years. And um, and it was people like Edie Sedgwick here uh, who sort of came to be part of Warhol's entourage at this time. He, he had this clique that he explicitly promoted. He called them his superstars. He coined that term. They became celebrities. So he was literally manufacturing celebrities there at, um, at the factory. And of course, he was also making some art too. That all, all came into the process as well. So here we can see that um, he was working with assistants and he was making a lot of silk screens and lithographs, things where he could make an original and then they could be reproduced uh, fairly easily. So don't get cynical about this because uh, having a workshop and having apprentices doing most of the work is something, is an age old tradition in, in art. Uh, probably your favorite Renaissance masters did the exact same thing. And um, and your favorite Renaissance painting uh, was maybe only, you know, touched up by a master in the face and the hand. So Andy Warhol could be fairly um, hands off in, in the production of a lot of this artwork, but he was still there at the factory and engaged with what was going on. But he was always coming up with new ideas as well. So a lot of his artwork had to deal with, or had to do with, with filmmaking. And his very first film, I find this hysterical, his very first film is simply called Sleep. It was a five hour film of his then boyfriend at the time, Simply Sleeping. And Andy Warhol screened this film for several of his friends. And so they're just watching this guy sleep, snore, roll over occasionally. And um, in the middle of it, Andy Warhol apparently said, gee, 
this is very boring. <laughs> Let's go get a cup of coffee. But he was once again doing something revolutionary by just filming someone sleeping and, and even imagining it that other people might be interested in watching it. This is, of course, the very genesis of reality TV. I'm sure all of us, uh, even if you don't want to admit it, we've probably watched at least an hour of reality TV where people were doing really boring things, but somehow because it was on a screen, we were fully engaged with it, weren't we? And Andy Warhol started it by filming his boyfriend sleeping. Now he was engaged with, um, with TV quite a bit throughout his career. In fact, he said he wanted to do a special on his favorite subject, which was, he said, nothing and he would call it the nothing special that sort of seems like a precursor to Seinfeld in some ways he had two tv shows um including Andy Warhol's tv um and also Andy Warhol's 15 minutes and he made uh, referring to the 15 minutes of fame quote that we started with that Gianna shared and besides that he um made frequent celebrity appearances on shows like The Love Boat and SNL and that sort of thing. So ultimately, Andy Warhol produced something like 150 films. A lot of them were experimental films like Empire or Chelsea Girls. But I wanted to share uh, these film stills with you to see where it all began. Andy Warhol also dipped his toe into publishing. He was a co-founder of Interview Magazine. I love the cover of the first issue, the first issue collector's edition, all this nudity. What a great way to get um, some attention. Well, here he is in, um, is in a Polaroid from years later reading the, his own magazine with his name splashed across the cover. Uh, Interview Magazine was nicknamed the, the crystal ball of pop because it gave him so much access to... Um, artists or well really uh singers and actors and um and models and so everybody was really interested in in what he was producing there so if you're wondering whatever happened to interview magazine it did shut down in 2018 but i think it relaunched the same year so i think it might still be around and here is uh, a cover from the 1990s so long after andy warhol's death they are still um banking on his celebrity. They're showing Andy Warhol in drag um, with this kind of silkscreen process that he becomes so famous for. So um, as with so many things, the idea of Interview Magazine became a self-perpetuating cycle of celebrity. So let's fully turn our attention to celebrity now. Andy Warhol said, my idea of a good picture is one that's in focus and of a famous person. <laughs> so he is probably the very first person to unabashed, unabashedly love the famous um, when he himself was already famous too. And of course, that brings us to the quote that he said, you know, in the future, everybody would be famous for 15 minutes. And with YouTube, it's kind of true, isn't it? He predicted the future there. So we are now looking at his 1962 painting called The Golden Marilyn. And he created this uh, soon after the actress's apparent suicide that same year. And um, and he did this based off of uh, stills uh, of, of photos of her from a movie that she had done in the 1950s called Niagara. And then he silk screens that image of her and he adds color to it, this kind of um, bright, almost garish color, this turquoise um, collar here. And then these heavy lidded eyes have this turquoise uh, blue eyeshadow on it, uh, almost blood red lips here, uh, pink flesh of her face, and then this brassy golden hair. Um, and then he surrounds it with gold as though she is a, a saint or as though she is the divine. And uh, that brings us right back to that church that he grew up with, uh, those icons that he stared at as a child multiple times a week. Well, he has transformed a celebrity into one of those saints. He's literally canonized her here, um, especially so because of this untimely death that she experienced. I think it's worth noting that, um, that he has almost rendered her face somewhat mask-like in this case, especially with this sort of cheap tabloid processing of 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 this of the the silk screening here. And that perhaps speaks to the idea that if she had committed suicide, that, that she, even though she's this beautiful public figure, that she was struggling with things that were obviously beneath the surface. And that you see him exploring once again in this next work from the same year called the Maryland Diptych. 
And the diptych, uh, diptych is uh, an art historical term that essentially refers to a two panel painting. Um, historically, they were often hinged together so they could be folded closed or, or then opened up. And so those two panels oftentimes have a relationship to each other. Here, he's replicated that same golden Marilyn um, a number of times. And then there's like a ghostly image of that Marilyn over on the right here in black and white. So, uh, so he's playing with that notion of the mask and the general recognizability of this woman. Uh, and, you know, in, in some places she's almost indiscernible, but she's become commodified, obviously, like the, the Coca-Cola bottles or like the Campbell soup cans in so many ways. But um, I think it is also interesting that he is playing with this especially sultry image of her and, and trying to play up just how sultry she is, um, uh, uh, knowing and, and balancing off this um, this this sad aspect of her life, uh, the the struggles that that she was dealing with, kind of behind the scenes there. So um, silk screening here. I, I haven't mentioned yet, is a printmaking process. It's something that was usually reserved for the world of commercial art. Andy Warhol didn't invent it. He wasn't the first fine artist ever to use it, but he is the person that um, that really employs it to, to such an extent, to, to such an extensive, uh, 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 to such an extent as an artist. So each one of these silk screens is considered an original work of art. Okay. So um, he continues on with pop culture, with the celebrities that he loves. He turns his attention to Liz Taylor. And once again, we can see him not really attempting to align the different registers here in terms of the silk screen. He's not trying to perfectly place the red on her lips or the turquoise even over her, her eyebrows here. Somehow, just the red lips and the, and the blue eyes are enough to signify just um, her femininity, uh, her her sex appeal here, and so uh, so the black areas of this silk screen again are are printed as though it were a cheap tabloid newspaper, and so we get um, this very rough sense of who she is here. Uh, just the important parts in some ways. Now, Andy Warhol sort of became a little bit obsessed with, with Liz Taylor. And then later on, they, be, they became good friends. Andy Warhol said, I love Los Angeles. I love Hollywood. They're so beautiful. Everything's plastic, but I love plastic. I want to be plastic. He also said he wanted to be a machine at one point too. So, um, so to sort of round out his um, his bingo card of of 1950s celebrities, in the early 1960s, he created this double Elvis here, and it, it's Elvis, I believe, from one of his films where he was playing a cowboy. And I just love the double Elvis because it suggests movements. It reminds me of the way Elvis dances, and you can see that it's almost a life size silk screen here. Now. Now, apparently in this image where Andy Warhol is just hanging around with Bob Dylan, Bob Dylan had come to the factory. I believe he did a screen test while he was there. And then as payment for his time, he asked for the double Elvis. And I believe he got it because Andy Warhol was actually so starstruck by Bob Dylan that he that he let him take it. But I mean, ordinarily, it was like um, it, it, it was you should have paid to be able to have a screen test. You, should, you weren't going to be paid for it. And Bob Dylan was the only person who apparently got away with that. Now, another idea that Andy Warhol was playing with, uh, especially a little bit later on as he's working with silk screening, in the 1970s when uh, uh, diplomacy sort of opens up with China and Nixon uh, goes to visit Mao, Andy Warhol becomes fascinated by the images of Mao in China, and he begins to associate or at least see the parallel between political propaganda and capitalist advertising. So he does a whole series on Chairman Mao um, that you might be familiar with, and he continues to focus on celebrities, too. So here he is with Mick Jagger in the photograph and a, a, a portrait of Mick Jagger here. And you can see that by the 1970s, he's being a little bit more artful with the way that he's composing these silk screens. He's adding in what looks like some line drawings here and he's printing uh, certain colors with, um, with I, I, I feel like with 
a, a more expressive, more artistic bend here, rather than just trying to replicate something that looked like it was printed for a tabloid, but still focusing on the lips and the eyelids, very much so. So we'll round out uh, uh, Andy Warhol's approach to silkscreen portraits here with the last portrait of Blondie or Debbie Harry. We can see him taking the photograph that probably inspired the work over here on the left. And it brings us to how were these works received? Um, did did everybody want to be silk screened by Andy Warhol? I think to a certain degree, I think that's true because over the years, various computers and phones that I've had have allowed you to do that. Like you can you can replicate a, an Andy Warhol aesthetic pretty easily on your phones these days. But the critics weren't always so kind. One critic in particular um, that I came across said, you know, these, these works were superficial, they were facile, they were commercial, they had no depth or indication of the significance of the subjects. But I think the overall take is that's the point. <laughs> Andy Warhol wanted to focus on superficiality and, and um, commercialism as a mirror to our times, as the most brilliant mirror to our times. There's um, there's this sense that he had his finger on the pulse of, of what was important to Americans in the 1970s. And he produced images that spoke exactly to that. And of course, he inserted himself in this process too. Um, move over Kim Kardashian, it was actually Andy Warhol, who's the king of the selfies. <laughs> so we can see various photographs that he took of himself over the years, starting with the 1960s, where he looks like hipster off the street today, um, into, um, I, I believe this is from the 1980s. Uh, again, another image of him in drag, a Polaroid, where he's um, playing with gender here, playing with makeup and wigs. And then over to a very late self-portrait um, that was done, I believe, just a year or so before his death. And you can sort of get the sense that he is, there's like this, this grim solemnity to his face as though he sort of acknowledges that that um, his own death is, is sort of coming for him. And of course, the, the wig is um, all kinds of crazy here too. Okay. So that brings us to the subject of death and Andy Warhol. Um, when we think about celebrities, celebrities, especially if you make an image of them, they're immortal, right? But Andy Warhol had to contend with the notion of death in his works for a very interesting reason. Right after he did the Campbell Soup Cans, he had a curator friend say to him, you know, these are great, but if you really want to be taken seriously as an artist, you have to do something that's a little bit more serious. So Andy Warhol decided to do something called the Death and Disaster series. And this is an example of those works. It's another diptych, two panels together. And this is um, called the Mustard Race Riot from that Death and Disaster series. It's from 1963. So we have silk screened on one side, all of these newspaper images of a race riot in Birmingham, Alabama. And then on the other side, nothing, just that, that that golden color, a field of color there. And so he is, uh, it's almost as though he's forcing us to, to contend with that news and then perhaps even making a commentary of like how quickly that news comes and goes sometimes. So, um, so he continues on with the with the subject of death with heavier subjects here. I won't spend too much time with this, but but this was a, a, a work that he called the lavender disaster. And we are looking at an electric chair that had just been uh, sort of famously used two times that same year. And um, but I wanted to sort of jump ahead to the tuna fish disaster because it relates so well to his other work. We're looking at more cans here again, right? And um, and now not celebrities, but the faces of women who had been killed actually by some tainted tuna. <laughs> so here he's trying to add some gravitas to his work, but there's a, a little bit of, of a silliness to this too, just replicating the tuna cans and then the faces of, of those women who had passed away. So he's, he's finding his way in all of this. And I think he kind of finds success by the time he gets to these uh, nine Jackies in 1964. So this was just on the heels of President Kennedy's death. And, uh, and of course, um, as that happened, as, as that news unfolded and the country mourned the loss of this young president, uh, 
people were exposed to Jackie Kennedy's response to it and and her grief and her emotion. And I think for in, in large part, it helped them process their own feelings. So these images of Jackie Kennedy were so um, important to the country at the time. And Andy Warhol essentially makes a history painting about the death of the president without even including the president in it or like the facts of his death other than how it impacted his wife. So we see her here smiling, we see her here um, grieving and in shock and, um, and here he is once again giving us an entirely new way of picturing or um, or, or making permanent some moment in uh, some important moment in our, our, our history here. So um, death is something that actually came for Andy Warhol uh, not too much longer later. Uh, you might remember that Andy Warhol was shot in 1968. Uh, the woman who shot him was a woman named Valerie Solanas who um, had been kind of in the circle of people who were visiting at the factory. And I think they had even done a film together at some point. She was there to, I think, pick up a, a script that she had dropped off and Andy Warhol was meeting with a museum curator. She came in and she shot at the curator. He got a su superficial wound and was treated and released from the hospital. She shot three times at Andy Warhol, missed twice, but that third shot went through his spleen, his stomach, his liver, his esophagus, and his lungs. And when I say that he was on death's door, I mean, it's not hyperbole. He was at, he, he made it to the emergency room. He had no pulse, but by some stroke of luck, the doctor opened his eye and saw that his pupil responded to light and they were able to bring him back. And so, um, Andy Warhol, uh, well, they say he lived for 20 years after that, but there was a part of him that sort of departed after such a horrible experience. So um, not surprisingly, he um, he wanted to share with the world what, what, he, what he experienced. And so he got a great photographer, Richard Avedon, to take these photographs of him shortly afterwards. And the scars, I mean, they're shocking. He, he went through so much and so many surgeries to keep him alive. And then he had to wear this corset for the rest of his life. I love the, the look on his face over here. Um, and here's just a, another detail of all of the scars. Just that one bullet did so much damage to his poor body. So um, he was obviously physically and emotionally scarred by what he went through. The artist Alice Neal did a portrait of Andy Warhol in 1970, so about two years after the shooting. And he took his shirt off for this portrait and he's wearing that corset and you can see the scars and she's painted him in such a way that it almost looks like he has women's breasts here. And he just looks so incredibly vulnerable and 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 old and and, and sort of uh, feeble here. But um, but also kind of determined to persevere in some ways. I think it's such an incredible and beautiful portrait that we see here. So this brings us to Andy Warhol's legacy and in his actual death here. So um, one of the very smart things that he did towards the end of his career, I mean, he, I don't think he was as interested in, you know, going out to Studio 54, but he became very interested in younger artists and supporting the careers of younger artists and sort of like Oprah, he would choose people. He would choose people who were interesting and worth people's time. And that just catapulted them to stardom, including Keith Haring over here on the left and Jean-Michel Basquiat, who we see over on the right. Um, and these were essentially two graffiti artists that uh, became international superstars, really. And then Andy Warhol, very smartly, began to collaborate with them, to make artwork with them. This is a publicity still um, uh, related to a, a collaboration that Warhol did with Basquiat. Now, Basquiat died at the age of 27, so young. But it's because of this relationship, really, with Andy Warhol that we still remember his name, or that a work like this by Basquiat 
uh, recently sold for $110 million. Really, very few graffiti artists go from um, anonymity to a superstar status and then um, to record-breaking auction prices without the help of a superstar like Andy Warhol. So let's turn our attention to Andy Warhol's uh, death and end of life. So I've just inserted one of his silk screens here appropriately of a skull. Now, Andy Warhol died in 1987 at the age of 58. Now, according to news reports, he'd been making a good recovery from like a routine gallbladder surgery, um, but he died in his sleep after a post-operative irregular heartbeat. So after his death, he was brought back to Pittsburgh for a bur uh, his burial. And of course, this was a, a star-studded event too. Yoko Ono spoke at his funeral. And then Andy Warhol was laid to rest beside his mother and his father. Um, Today, the Andy Warhol Museum, which is located in Pittsburgh, is one of the largest museums in the United States dedicated, it is the largest museum in the United States dedicated to a single artist and one of the most comprehensive single artist museums in the world. Um, there are thousands of works of art on display. A lot of the, the funds that were raised for this museum were um, came from the auction of Andy Warhol's actual possessions. And that also started uh, a foundation called the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts Program, which uh, still to this day is one of the greatest funders of artists in this country. They recently gave away, I think, $4 million to 20 different artists across the United States just this year. So that's a really important legacy uh, um, that, that uh, I think his family should be so proud of. And of course, when it comes to auctions, he is like the bellwether for, um, for the art market and i'm sure you probably heard that just uh just two years ago now this image shot sage blue uh, shot, shot sage blue maryland from 1964 sold for a record record breaking 195 million dollars it's really hard to believe but if andy warhol's selling basically the rest of the art market's doing pretty well he was only 36 years old when he made this so it brings us to the very end <laughs> we end with the idea that this poor boy from Pittsburgh who grew up in the depression was able to make it as a success in New York City. Um, he went on from that to revolutionize the art world to become a worldwide superstar while in the process supporting the careers of other artists. He was an indisputable success. He balanced commercial and entrepreneurial endeavors with avant-garde and underground work. He lived a life that was very true to who he was. And it's probably the reason why people still go to his grave and leave uh, tomato soup cans for him to this day. Now, the most appropriate tribute to Andy Warhol is the fact that there is a camera on his grave that does a live feed to the internet 24 hours a day still. <laughs> so it, it, it's just the perfect way to honor a man who made a five hour movie about sleep, <laughs> but also the perfect way to extend Andy Warhol's 15 minutes of fame. So I will end there now and I welcome any questions or comments you have about Andy Warhol. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll start going through the Q&A here too. Um, Deborah says, did Andy Warhol get permission to use these brands in his art? Uh, Deborah, I should know that, but my hunch is no. <laughs> um, he, uh, he was just trying to make this very bold leap, but probably not surprisingly, these brands began to collect him. I think the Coca-Cola company owns something like 15 or 20 of his paintings now on the subject of Coca-Cola. So, um, so he did it well enough that, that he didn't get in trouble. Uh, Stephen says, too bad he was not alive for Princess Diana. You're right. He would have canonized her, too. Great comment, Stephen. Uh, Diane says, were there copyright issues with his pictures of living celebrities or did he get releases from those celebrities? Did they get any royalties? Um, Diane, these are all great questions and I don't have the specific answers, but my sense is, is that the celebrities wanted uh, to be uh, canonized and, and um, captured, uh, uh, immortalized, I should say, by Andy Warhol. So I think they were willing participants that uh, that essentially gave that permission. I don't think he, um, I don't think he ever asked for permission for logos or pictures or that sort of thing. 
Um, and part of part of pop art was really just appropriating these things and maybe um, begging for forgiveness later if, if these kinds of issues arose. Uh, an anonymous attendee said he had a very distinctive hair and dress style that reminds me of Georgia O'Keeffe. Was he influenced by her? Wow, great association. Um, Georgia O'Keeffe is another person that, you know, would wear a lot of black. Um, you know, I, in my research, I didn't come across any any cross-pollination there, but Georgia O'Keeffe certainly had that same almost commercial like aesthetic with her painting where oftentimes she strove to make her brushwork invisible. So it's really interesting to think that, that, um, that maybe they, they sort of learned from each other. I do know that by the time she was in her eighties, she and Andy Warhol would hang out. <laughs> but I think that was more of a function of the fact that they were both famous and artists um, more so than the fact that they were um, learning from each other's work. But great question. Thank you for asking. Um, Carol, thanks for the kind words. Theo says, are there any living relatives? Oh, Theo, thanks for asking because um, I'm not sure if they're living, but he did have um, brothers, as I mentioned, and they had children. So uh, one of his nephews, James Warhol, wrote uh, stories about Uncle Andy. So those are good things to be looking forward to, uh, looking for. Uh, maybe there's even some some books at the Chelmsford Library or um, some of our partnering libraries, but. Um, I'm not sure if any of those descendants are still alive today. It's probably a safe bet that they are. Edgar says, do you have the link to his gravesite camera internet transmission? Edgar, I'm sorry, I don't have it on hand, but if you were to Google right now, probably, uh, live feed of Warhol's grave, it would probably be the first thing that comes up. Okay, let's see, I think we got through. Okay, one more question here. A curator at the Warhol Museum told me they have boxes and boxes of his paper that they haven't even looked at yet. Wow, I have not been there. That's on my bucket list. Uh, sounds like they need a lot of interns over there. <laughs> um, that's really interesting to know. And it is fascinating. Even like the smaller museums that I've worked at have such a backlog of, of that sort of thing. And that those are like the treasure troves too. So um, so thanks for sharing that. So that's really fascinating. I think we'll we'll be learning a lot more about Andy Warhol as all of those things are are kind of poured through. Oh, thanks for adding the the gravesite in the chat too. I appreciate that. Um, let's see here. I'm just going back in the chat to see if there's more questions back there. I always love to see where people are from. Thanks for adding that. Chicago, New Jersey, this is so exciting. Um, let's see here. The UK. Um, oh, and then Melvin adds that he, that Andy Warhol was doing the starving artist tactics as a professional. That's really interesting in, insight. Um, you know, obviously, I, I I don't remember much of Andy Warhol from like my childhood, but it's interesting. It's always interesting to to me to hear from people. You know, what were their impressions of him? Um, when uh, when Warhol was alive, Melvin says, "Amazing how he did branding before that was a thing." When you think Andy, when you think Warhol, a very specific image comes to mind. Arguably, he influenced manga production. Manga is created as a sort of conveyor belt fashion with a number of assistants doing the bulk of the work. That's so interesting. Actually, next month's artist, if you're going to come to next month's program, Kehinde Wiley, really, uh, and he did the famous portrait of President Obama. Um, really interesting in terms of um, the assistance and how they contribute to his work. This, it, so this is like an ongoing issue in in, um, in the world of art. Um, but branding, yeah, I mean, he had he had this foresight. He, you know, it's like he understood the the zeitgeist really of what was happening in America and what an influence that he's had. I think we our our awareness to and maybe even appreciation of branding today. I mean, it all comes from him. Lisa's here. Hi, Lisa. Lisa says he challenges the notion of iconography from religious icons to his symbology of home. Brilliantly put, Lisa. I love that. Thank you for contributing that. And yes, it just you just beautifully tied everything together there. Um, Camus is considered to be an existentialist writer, but Warhol came up with the popular look of self-labeled existentialists in, in France in nineteen in the nineteen sixties. I wonder if art schools address the business side of art. Um, <laughs> uh, 
they touch on it. It's very interesting. It, with the art schools that that I'm familiar with, it's it's uh, it's always offered up as a piece of it. But I think Andy Warhol was probably just just as interested in in the business side of of it than um, than than the art making side too. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, lots of questions about did he get permission? I do I do not think he did. Um, and Lisa adds to, given how much he alters the reference image too. Thanks for adding that, Lisa. And Jeff, you're asking if I could explain the silk screening process. I would I would be explaining it very badly, I think. But I think there's wonderful, wonderful resources. And for me, I'm such a visual person to like watch someone on YouTube, like how to make a silk screen. That would probably be your best bet because I, I I'm afraid I would explain it pretty badly. Um, Okay, I think, did he dye his hair white, Alice asked. Alice, he started wearing, I'm not sure if at, at an early age he started to dye his hair white, but um, at, at a pretty early age, he started wearing a wig. So it might've been a wig. Um, even the, um, before the wigs be got, got very wild, um, he was wearing um, some hair. Okay. Um, oh, Diane asked, do I know how many silk screens in total he made? Whoa. It, it's a huge number. <laughs> I don't know offhand, but that's a great question to try and track down. It seems as though there's an unlimited, uh, um, uh, uh, an unlimited number. And Prachi asks, what do I mean to make the brush strokes invisible? I'm so glad you asked for clarity on that. Um, it's really this idea. Okay. So what, if, if we're thinking about making the brush strokes visible, that would be like French impressionism, like just blotting it. And, um, making the brushstrokes invisible means uh, creating the seamless effect of, let's say you're doing a portrait, like the seamless effect of perfect flesh, of the textures of somebody's hair or of their sweater or something like that, to almost make something look photographic. And, um, and certainly artists were striving towards that even before photography existed. Uh, um, and then it becomes a, a whole different thing when we're talking about commercial art too. So, uh, so I'm glad you asked for clarification there and I'm sorry I didn't make that clear as I went along. Um, let's see. I think I got to most of these and thank you everybody to for um, for your kind words. Benita asked what happened to his studio? Oh, Benita, forever ago, I had been looking at that. Um, I think people in New York City like do travel around to the different sites just to like go to like those doorsteps. But I think these uh, the studios have long since become other things, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, any thoughts on Jeff Koons carrying Warhol's mantle? Yeah, he's probably the best person doing that these days, or one of the best person, one of the best people. Um, I think we just about covered all of it, Gianna. And thank you everybody for the very kind words. And again for being with us tonight. I very, very much appreciate that. Awesome. Yes, yeah, so I see a couple people have asked if um, this was recorded. So yes, the presentation was recorded. Um, all of you that have registered will get an email with that recording. So take a look in your inboxes for that sometime tomorrow, or hopefully early next week, if not that. Um, so, uh, and again, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Jane, thank you again for a great presentation. I look forward to seeing everybody back, hopefully for next month for February Black History Month, uh, Kahinde Wiley, Color and Splendor. And that's gonna be February 29th at 7 <laughs> p.m. So please register for that as well. Thank all you right, so everybody, much. have a good night. Have a good night.